Good morning. I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman. Here's the top five things to know this Tuesday. Number one, the state of emergency declared in Puerto Rico. The island is bracing for Tropical Storm Dorian less than two years after Hurricane Maria killed thousands of people. And Dorian is expected to strengthen into a hurricane as early as tonight and could lash Puerto Rico as a Category 1 storm by tomorrow. As residents stock up on supplies, authorities are opening 360 shelters across the island and they're sending radios and satellite phones to all police departments and mayors, something that was not done before Hurricane Maria. Meanwhile, in South Florida, more than 200 first responders are packing up and heading to the Caribbean as part of the preparation effort. Number two, the landmark ruling in the nation's opioid epidemic. A judge has ordered Johnson & Johnson to pay $572 million for helping to fuel the opioid crisis in Oklahoma. The company says it will appeal. But legal experts say this ruling could have nationwide consequences and could prompt other companies to settle similar cases being brought in other states. On to number three now. President Trump is back in Washington this morning from the G7 summit. Before leaving France, he skipped a discussion on climate change. An empty chair was left in his place. His aides were there instead. So the president said he was meeting with the leaders of Germany and India, but both of those leaders managed to attend the climate talks. Meanwhile, there's a new battle in the fight to save the Amazon rainforest. A top official in Brazil says the government there will reject the $20 million in aid offered by world leaders at the G7 summit, suggesting the money should be used instead to reforest Europe. Number four, charges will be announced today against four employees at a South Florida nursing home for their alleged role in the heat-related deaths of 12 patients. Back in 2017, the facility went without air conditioning for days after Hurricane Irma. The employees blamed the power company for not restoring electricity quickly enough. Some employees involved are expected to be charged with manslaughter. And finally, number five, a new study about people who post lots of selfies. The researchers at Washington State University found people who post lots of pictures they take of themselves are generally viewed by others as less likable than people who share pictures that other people take of them. People with high selfie counts are also seen as less successful and more insecure. So take a picture of yourself reading that study. So that brings us yeah. to our question of the day. How do you feel about people posting a lot of selfies on social media? Do you post a lot of selfies on social media? Do you care about people posting a lot of selfies on social media? Will this study make you think twice about taking selfies? Tell us in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. Let us know. And let's also get to that big story. The landmark ruling in the nation's opioid epidemic. A judge has ordered Johnson & Johnson to pay $572 million for helping to fuel the opioid crisis in Oklahoma. But many questions remain, including what this could mean for hundreds of other cases across the country. And where the money will go if that judgment is upheld. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi has the latest. Mona, good morning. Good morning, Jane. Good morning to you, Kenneth. The amount was actually a fraction of the judgment that Oklahoma sought, but the decision could have a profound effect on similar lawsuits. An Oklahoma judge making history, becoming the first to hold a drug maker responsible for the devastating effects of the opioid crisis. Johnson & Johnson will finally be held accountable for thousands of deaths and addiction caused by their activities. In a landmark ruling, the judge ordering Johnson & Johnson to pay $575 million for, quote, false misleading marketing campaigns, increasing addiction and overdose deaths. The decision, a sign of hope to families ravaged by the epidemic. Nothing's going to bring my son back, but this victory allows his, his death to stand for something. Gail and Craig Box are among those who testified at trial. Their son Austin was a linebacker at the University of Oklahoma who started taking painkillers after a back injury. The young man was hooked quickly and then died of an overdose in 2011. The state's lawsuit alleged Johnson & Johnson created a public nuisance and demanded more than $17 billion. The company used pseudoscience and misleading information that downplay the risks of opioids. Johnson & Johnson denies those claims and has vowed to appeal. Johnson & Johnson did not cause the opioid abuse crisis here in Oklahoma or anywhere in this country. 
And as we speak, 48 states, including more than 2,000 local and tribal governments, have pending lawsuits against drug makers. So, Janae Kenneth, this is really just the beginning. Yeah, you're right about that. Mona Kosar Abdi in Washington, thank you. We appreciate it. And President Trump and the First Lady are back at the White House following the G7 summit in France. The Trumps arrived home from the three-day international meeting last night. Next year, they will host the annual event, and it seems the president is considering expanding the guest list and using one of his own properties. ABC's Meredith McGraw has the details. In 2020, the United States will host leaders from around the world, and the president will get to pick the location and choose the invitees. Potentially among them, Russian President Vladimir Putin. I think it's a positive for the world. I think it's a positive for Russia. I think it's a big positive for Russia. Uh, and it's something the group is discussing. It was once the G8, but Russia was kicked out in 2014 for its annexation of Crimea, making it the G7. At a press conference here in France, the president was asked if he thinks it's a politically good idea to invite the Russians after they meddled in the 2016 election. He said he doesn't do things for a political reason. I do nothing for politics. I know a lot of you aren't going to, you're going to smile at that. I do nothing for politics. I do what's right. And despite opposition from other G7 leaders said, quote, having them inside the room is better than outside the room. As for the setting, the president said he's looking at Miami, Florida and pitched his own property in what sounded like a commercial. We have a series of magnificent buildings. We call them bungalows. They each hold from 50 to 70 very luxurious rooms with magnificent views. It's a proposal that could raise ethics concerns, but when asked about a potential conflict of interest, Trump said he's not trying to boost his brand or make money, even though the event will cost taxpayers millions of dollars. The president said White House officials have narrowed it down to 12 potential locations for next year's summit, but he says none compare to his own resort. The United States has hosted the G7 before in 2012 at Camp David and in 2004 in Sea Island, Georgia. Meredith McGraw, ABC News, Saint Jean de Luz, France. And federal prosecutors plan to seek the death penalty against the man accused in the deadly Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Investigators say the suspect opened fire at the Tree of Life synagogue, killing 11 people and injuring several others last October. He has pleaded not guilty to multiple charges, including hate crimes. Newark, New Jersey is getting $120 million to replace pipes contaminating water with lead. This follows a recent announcement that the city's drinking water was polluted with elevated levels of lead. Newark has been offering bottled water to thousands of households that may have been using the lead-contaminated tap water. New video this morning of a massive rockfall at Zion National Park in Utah. Take a look at this. Three people were injured Saturday. Saturday more than a dozen others were stranded when a large section of that mountain fell 3,000 feet onto the trails below. Several trails are now closed. And women's soccer star Carly Lloyd is considering a career in the NFL. After making that 55-yard kick you see there, the Philadelphia Eagles practice, she says several teams reached out to her. She tells NBC Sports, quote, there's no reason why a woman could not do this. Nothing scares me. We'll see if she gets an offer. Women's Equality Day brings two iconic names into the world of Barbie. So Mattel has released dolls honoring Rosa Parks and Sally Ride. Miss Parks, known as the mother of the freedom movement, helped trigger the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott in 1955. And Sally Ride was the first American woman to fly in space in 1983. Both of those dolls will come with educational material about both women. Mm. And a second grader from Wichita, Kansas, is teaching all of us a thing or two this morning about reaching out to someone in need. The start of a new school year can be stressful for any kid, but it was particularly hard for eight-year-old Connor, who has autism. He was finding it difficult to adjust and was off by himself crying when another eight-year-old boy, Christian, came over to him just to hold his hand. Christian's mother captured the moment and shared it on social media. Connor's mother, who you see there, find back some tears. She responded with a heartfelt thanks. The two boys are now inseparable. Love Beautiful way story. to start a friendship. Love it, love it. Well, coming up, new fires are blazing in the Amazon rainforest. Firefighters are struggling to put out the wildfires, and Brazil's president is refusing international aid. But first, Democratic candidates are preparing for the next debate hosted by ABC News. We'll tell you who's made the cut after this.
Welcome back. A new poll suggests the race for the Democratic presidential nomination is tightening. It shows former Vice President Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren in a virtual three-way tie for the lead. The Monmouth University poll shows Biden's support slipping with Sanders and Warren surging. The three are guaranteed spots in their party's next debate. As of now, seven other candidates have also qualified for the September 12th debate, which will be hosted by ABC News. The deadline for qualifying is coming up as we hear from ABC's Brad Milkey. Brad, good morning. Hey guys, that's right. It might still seem early, but we are about to see a crucial moment in the 2020 race. That's because tomorrow night, the lineup for the next debate will be set. So far, only 10 candidates appear to have qualified for ABC's debate in September. That is way fewer than the last couple debates. The reason is the Democratic Party decided candidates should have to hit higher polling thresholds to get in. Starting with this next debate, you need to hit 2% in four different qualifying polls. Now, only certain polls will get you in. So I asked ABC's deputy political director, Mary Alice Parks, who's on the outside looking in. Businessman Tom Steyer only needs one more poll to qualify. And that's fascinating because he was a really late addition in the race. But he's a billionaire and he has spent a ton of money on ads, especially in early voting states. He's really ratcheted up his name ID. And then Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii, she needs two more polls to qualify. And, and that's tough because we don't know exactly how many polls will be released between now and tomorrow night. And if you want some extra drama, you guys, 10 candidates means that for the first time this election season, this would be a one night debate, one night only. But if Steyer or Gabbard or anyone else can make it onto that stage, they would actually be forcing a two night event. We'll have a lot more on this Democratic deadline on Start Here later this morning. Listen on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. Janae, Kenneth. All right. Our thanks to Brad. More than a thousand new fires have sprung up in the Amazon rainforest in just the past few days. The firefighters are struggling to contain the blazes, but making little headway. The G7 countries agreed to provide more than $22 million in aid to Brazil, but Brazil's president is refusing their help. So let's go across the pond now to Bruno Rober in the London Bureau. Bruno, my friend, it's good to see you. So what's the latest on this fire? Yes, it's extraordinary. We've seen an 84% increase in fires from the same time last year. Now, let's, let's just take a look at Matt Gutman's piece. Um, he went right to the front line of the fires and uh, shows us this report. This fire was not here about 10 minutes ago. It swept through here with enormous ferocity. You can see all that dry brush inside this being completely chewed up by that fire. And those palm trees, they light up like matchsticks. There's so much oil, especially at the top. It's incendiary. Now, this is just one of thousands of fires that are burning right now in Brazil and Bolivia and Ecuador along the entire Amazon area. It's shocking how fast we've seen this fire march. It's moved about 200 yards in the past five minutes alone, fueled by this wind. We're going to try to get moving a little bit faster to get out of its way. Keep going, keep going. You can see that it's chewing up not only all that dry brush, but those palm trees are acting like kindling. There's a lot of, whew, there's a lot of oil inside them and they are just exploding. This is the kind of fire that we saw across this entire valley from the plain. And this is what it looks like on the ground. Firefighters, no match for flames this ferocious. A few minutes ago, this was all beautiful, lush jungle. There were two cans flying out when we pulled in. Now it's a hellscape. And we're told that no matter how much international assistance comes in here, it won't be able to do much to stop these fires. There are simply too many of them. And the experts tell us there's only one thing that can stop them. That's Mother Nature. Matt Gutman, ABC News, along the Bolivian-Brazilian border. Well, as you can see, extraordinary scenes. I mean, the scale of these fires is quite extraordinary, but it has a political dimension as well, because Brazil's president, Bolonsaro, has made it quite clear that he sees the rainforest as a natural resource that should be exploited for use of the Brazilian people. And this is very much at odds with the global consensus about how important um, the Amazon rainforest is, is to the world. It's been likened to the world, to part of the world's lungs, if you see what, if you see what I mean. And the G7 
7 has offered millions. I mean, it's a relatively small amount in the overall scheme of things, but $20 million to help fight the FARC. Bolsonaro has said this is a form of colonialism and has apparently rejected the offer. But it's actually quite a complex issue because a lot of these fires are being set, it is, it is thought, by subsistence farmers. These are poor people who are looking just to survive and they're clearing the area. And we should remember that that actually a lot of that is very natural, if you see what I mean, in terms of northern Europe was entirely forested. We see it very largely denuded. So d using the woods and the, and the forestry as a natural resource is quite a natural thing. So many, many experts now argue that the only way you're really going to stop this happening is if you make the trees themselves more valuable alive than chopped down. And that requires lots of money being put into Brazil. So that's, that's part of the debate around this. It, it's a complicated story in a sense. Bruno, that was really great explaining that this is not just one-sided. This is not just about trees being cut down and the Amazon right. being on fire and, you know, the impacts to the uh, the the oxygen in the world, but there is a whole other side to this. So thank you very much for shedding light on that. Meanwhile, moving on to Hong Kong, where the city's mm. leader, Carrie Lam, says the government is open to starting a dialogue with pro-democracy protesters, but she's not budging on any of their demands. Tell us about that. Well, we've seen over the last weekend some of the most violent clashes between protesters and police that have been that have manifest in two months of protests. Um, I mean, whatever Carrie Lam says, it seems that we, there is an arm pass now. The protesters insisting their five demands, which include the end of the extradition treaty, which really kicked off these protests, but also now saying they want an independent inquiry, they want direct elections, they want the leader to go. So it, the, both sides hardening down in terms of their approach to uh, the, these issues. And it's really hard to see how you're going, that Hong Kong is going to find itself out of this, because you've also got Beijing on the other side, which are essentially the super heads of Hong Kong, really, although it's nominally independent or sort of autonomous. And they are, they are playing hardball here, both sides. So it's difficult to see how this thing is going to resolve itself. Uh, difficult indeed, and it's been going for quite some time. Uh, moving on, finally, we're seeing some video, Bruno, of what looks like an ocean of rock. Can you explain yeah. a little bit more about what we're seeing here? It's extraordinary. It's, I mean, for, for many of us, perhaps the closest thing we come to pumice, which is what you're seeing on the sea now, is in our bath when we're scrubbing off hard bits of skin. But this is actually a natural byproduct of volcanic eruptions. And this is an island of pumice the size of Manhattan in the Pacific near Tonga. It was thought to have been generated by an underwater volcano. Quite the most extraordinary thing. But actually, it's biologically quite a, quite a good thing for the ocean. It helps feed the coral, apparently. So extraordinary scenes and actually quite a healthy part of the regenerative process of the Pacific in that uh, part of in, in the Pacific Ocean. Hey, I always say Mother Nature knows what she's doing, Bruno. Yeah, Bruno, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. All, All right, right now you. let's get a check of our notifications, mm -hmm. starting with this viral video from a wedding where a woman catches a bouquet, and then the camera pans, finds her boyfriend, who she has a son with. Who's not so he's like, Who's holding the camera, the son? Because he's like, Dad, Shady, come yeah. on. Hey, next up, a breakout attempt at a zoo. This monkey scares himself as he shatters the glass. And it looks like there's another broken glass back there. Uh, it does look, I mean, the monkey wants out. Yeah. Um, it does feel a little bit of like Planet of the Apes. A little bit. Just a little bit. I think that's the opening scene. Moving on to a sports reporter who has proven how dedicated he is to his job. Really dedicated. Yep, he's there inside a soccer stadium in Russia. The sprinkler is watering the field and that reporter is not moving. After the water goes by once, of course, it has to come back. So the poor guy gets another soaking there. Oh, my goodness. It feels, feels like some of the news directors I work for in local that you're like, can you, you go stand live? There. Can yeah, you go live? No matter what. Can you go live? Storms, no matter what. We need your shot. And let's listen to some opera. A nice duet with this woman singing soprano and her dog with the backup vocals. Yeah, that's a good old baritone right there. Yeah. Good call and response. Hey, next up, a man has uh, ridden from apparently on a paddleboard from California to Hawaii. 
He did it to raise awareness for protecting oceans. That's what, some 3,000 miles. 77 days it took him. And he did it alone. No boat following behind him, allegedly. Allegedly. How um, did he eat? How did he sleep? Only an hour at a time to make sure that he didn't drift off course. And I think originally when I heard the story, I thought paddleboard. I thought it would be like a, you know, just a little small one. That looks like a pretty hardcore. Sophisticated mm -hmm. one. Yeah. yeah. And finally, an iguana. See, working out at the Key West Airport, because why not? Yeah, treadmill. What else would you expect to see there? Coming up, the notorious RBG making her first public appearance since her cancer treatment. Find out what she had to say about her health and her nickname. And we'll tell you what's coming up in the day ahead after this. Here's what to watch out for today. President Trump has no public events scheduled, uh, but he is scheduled to have lunch with Vice President Pence. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will speak at the American Legion Convention in Indianapolis. And Democratic Congresswoman Ilan Omar will hold a community forum on the Department of Homeland Security's immigration practices, including detention and deportation. Actress Lori Loughlin and her husband are expected to be in court on charges that they pay bribes to get their two daughters into USC. The hearing is to determine whether their lawyers have a conflict of interest that warrants disqualifying them from defending the couple. And the launch of the SpaceX Starhopper rocket has been delayed until today. Many more aggravation for people in surrounding town. Yesterday's plan lift off for the Mars rocket prototype prompted warnings for some residents of Boca Chica, Texas. Get away for a day. People living with, within two miles of the launch site received notices warning of possible shattered windows and, quote, potential risk to health and safety. The launch was aborted at the last minute. Plus, don't forget to tune into the debrief for an update on all our top stories in the briefing room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. And finally, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has made her first public appearance since a three-week course of radiation to fight a tumor. And she addressed her relatively new nickname and being a celebrity at age 86. I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. This morning, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is showing the world she's undeterred in the face of a new cancer fight. I am now 86 years old, yet people of all ages want to take their picture with me. <laughs> Amazing. On Monday, she made her first public appearance since revealing she had radiation treatment for a malignant tumor on her pancreas. She accepted an honorary law degree at the University of Buffalo and then spoke to the law students, her sense of humor on full display. It was beyond my wildest imagination that I would one day become the notorious RBG. <laughs> According to the court, Ginsburg's cancer was, quote, treated definitively and there is no evidence of disease elsewhere in the body. Ginsburg is now 86. She's been treated for various forms of cancer before. Her health has been in the spotlight because her retirement could give President Trump his third Supreme Court pick. But Ginsburg recently said she plans to serve as long as she can. I am very much alive. She is a titan. Indeed, the notorious RBG. That's it from us today. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.